Countdown Web Extra with Mr. Josh Gad, who is a co-star uh, of the 25 superb members of the Book of Mormon, uh, the greatest uh, musical of, uh, claimed of the century. And you're also sort of working backwards into the 20th century, too. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, the century is not that long, so it, it it's kind of seems like a specious claim. But I, we're happy to take it. Yeah, 11 years is a, is a good <laughs> yeah, it's not much of an the best, is it? Right, if you said best in 11 yeah. years, you'd go, that's pretty, we're doing okay. That's good. It's good. We're going to run a little risk here on the on the online extra because uh, mm -hmm. we're going to talk both politics and 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 also uh, also Book of Mormon. And when we have done this privately without television cameras, we have managed on a couple of occasions to stay out on 49th Street and do this for like an hour on yes. the street. So yes, we do. This could run a little longer than planned, or maybe not, depending By on how. By the time we're done, hookers start coming up to us that's and right. they turn positioning the, me. That's right. They turn the, <laughs> turn the light off on the marquee. And I thought, you know, it might be kind of like. <laughs> Um, let me start. Let me start with the show. Uh, I said this on the air, and I absolutely mean it. I've said it to you before. I think the only thing that you guys are missing is the opportunity to sit out front and appreciate it. Yeah. And, and I'm not, not name dropping here, but since I've had now a conversation with almost everybody in the cast, everybody is really genuinely lovely, and and kind and generous. And Nikki James said, "Gee, you know, I, people, people, I'm just get a little worried when everybody's so enthusiastic about the show because they're sort of expecting it to be great." And I'm going, "You could mail it in one night, and it would still, it would still be great." But my point is, it's great material, mm -hmm. but none of you mail it in. How? Where does the stamina come to do this full bore every night? Well, I mean, I, I think we're all very aware of what a special moment this is. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, to me, having been involved for four years from the very nascent stages of this project, mm -hmm. when it was one act, uh, we did it on a black box theater. Trey and Matt had literally written um, the Book of Mormon, a screenplay <laughs> on the cover. Like, it, it really, it was, it was nothing more than a collection of songs and the promise of something great. Right. And, from that very first moment, we all looked at it and said, this, if it can be done, is very special. Mm -hmm. To then fast forward to four years and all of the accolades and um, you know, uh, creating this fierce environment where people are waiting at four o'clock in the morning for standing room tickets, y y you recognize how important this is, how it is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And we take that very seriously. Yeah. And so, Night after night, it, it really is our honor. It really is an honor to perform this show. Um, having said that, I'd probably say the same thing if I were in Mamma Mia because they pay me <laughs> to do that. But I, you know, it, it is. I, I can safely say that and mean it. It's it's the opportunity of a lifetime. Something that your your friend and as I noted on the air, your college roommate Rory O'Malley said yeah. to me when I said asked him basically the same question. He said. You have to understand one other thing here, which is the longest, the most job security I've ever previously had was four months. Yeah. That this is something that no one, I mean, people just don't stop and think. It's like looking at, at athletes and going, yeah, well, they have this great life, and it, but it's often for very short durations. It is. Uh, it is. And Rory in particular, I think, should be worried because all of us have been, you know, noting a decline in his performance lately. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> I love Rory to death. Oh, I, um, I, I do think that to a certain extent, the other really nice thing about this show is it has no celebrity, you know, quotient to it. There is mm -hmm. no A-lister headlining it. Not to say that that's a bad thing, but there's something remarkable about the fact that the biggest commercial success this year is a show with very unrecognizable people in it. Mm -hmm. Because at its core, what that says to me is that the content itself is doing all the work. And I think that you know, there is something to Rory saying, well, you know, I think that that goes for everybody in the cast. Yeah. None of us have had that breakout success. Um, I, I think that's I, changing. You know, it, it is. Yes. It certainly is. But it's, we take it, again, we take that very seriously. We know what this opportunity means to all of us. All right. We, you mentioned that you that this was in development and you were almost all of you were involved in this project mm -hmm. from for four, a lot of us. Yeah, all right. But so how did so this is like I mean I was once 25 30 years ago somebody thought I might make a good game show host and they said we're going to rehearse this idea for a game show. I'm going to call my agent right yeah, now. Yeah, well but, but listen to this. Yeah. We're going to we're going to do this in an airless attic in Burbank, California Ooh. above one of the bungalows that was built in 1926. And all we're going to need from you is like four hours a day to be in this <laughs> bungalow. And, and if it works, you've signed a contract that commits you to it for the next six years. 
And I said, gosh, what a deal that sounds like. <laughs> Is it was it was it like that? It was like sign here, and then maybe you'll be a success, and we own you, or what? No, what? no, no, not, nothing like that. It was it was much more of this planting seeds. It was constantly planting seeds. You know, four years ago it started off as I said as one act, and um, it ended with me singing "Man Up," and there was no like even chorus surrounding that big that you act one finale, um, and. As uh, the years progressed and Trey and Matt had uh, hiatuses from South Park and Bobby Lopez, their co-writer, mm -hmm. um, had the opportunity to work with them uh, during those breaks, they started to write more and more and they started to create this incredible narrative about these two guys who got sent to Uganda on a mission uh, and all hell breaks loose. Um, we all knew it was very special, but as time went on, it became really difficult to get out of other commitments, to kind of pave the way for ourselves to be included in mm -hmm. it. Uh, I was offered a lot of things that I wasn't necessarily fond of, but you gotta pay the bills, yeah. I've got a family. Yeah. And so it was always like hoping that the opportunity would arise. And then about a year ago, things started to become real. And you know, we saw that things were changing, that, that the tone was shifting into, uh, you know, the constant workshop phase into something much more incredible and dramatic, which was this opportunity to go, potentially go to Broadway. Uh, the things that I hear most from people who don't have the opportunity to see it are touring prospects in the future, and the other thing that I keep thinking of, movie, could you make this into, could this be a movie? Is it possible? Oh, I, I think, well certainly the tour's already been announced. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna open in Jerusalem in, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christmas, Christmas 2012. Uh, uh, no, they are. They're actually going to um, to do the show next year. I think um, starting in Denver, which is really exciting because uh, obviously Trey and Matt have a long history mm -hmm. uh, with Colorado. But um, plus, try singing in rarefied atmospheres. That exactly. Be <laughs> uh, and then uh, I, I think that there's bound to be a film. I mean, I, to me, it's a no-brainer. Now, Daniel Radcliffe will play which of you when it gets this? Well, Daniel, Daniel Radcliffe, through the gift of CGI, will play both of us. Uh, Andy Serkis will, will perform my role through motion capture, and it's going to be a really interesting film. Uh, no, you know, I, I, I do. I think that by the time the movie's made, we'll probably, I'll definitely probably be too old, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Justin Bieber will make a fine, put a little fat pad on him and call it a day, and, and it's going to be a great movie. Do you, is this the sort of thing where you look at it and, and, and there, you can actually say to yourself, I'm not being egotistical or overly prideful or any of these other supposed uh, shameful traits that anybody would have in the public eye, but saying to yourself, I want people to see this because it's so damn good? <clears throat> I have absolutely, absolutely no difficulty in saying, you know, you know when I knew it was really special is I could safely say to myself, if I were fired today, and you know today being the the before the show even opened yeah. i could safely look at friends and family without that you know hardship of of being jealous and say regardless you've got to spend as much money as you can to see this show because it's special and it's a testament to the writing the, the writers have done such a remarkable job and have in my mind solidified their status as kings of satire yes Plus, as has been noted many times, it is a textbook musical. It is a textbook. Text, it is a. It is a 1960s. Yeah. It is. When I first saw it, I thought it is very much like How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, which is you know the breakout hit of 1961. Absolutely. And if for some reason there weren't you know so much in the terms of the vocabulary that you couldn't find 40 seconds in a row without something that couldn't be shown on television. It, it would still <laughs> it would still work like blazes. Yeah, there, I mean, it really follows, you know, Trey, Trey in particular, um, I think really respects musical theater um, and loves like Rodgers and Hammerstein and yeah. things like that. And, and anybody who sees it really notices that it is an homage to the great musicals. Um, 
and uh, and it also has elements of Wicked in it, and it also has elements of you know a lot of modern day things like Lion King. And so, just a little. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, I'm surprised that, that Disney hasn't gotten after me yet. Um, you know, it's it really is incredible that what we're getting away with. But th there is a deep, profound respect for yes. the history yeah. of musical theater in this show. And I think people love that because a lot of musicals these days are trying to reinvent the wheel, trying to redefine what a musical is, right. which is great. But sometimes it's nice to go back to the tradition. I asked your, your co-star, Mr. Randalls, about this mm -hmm. and about the amount of effort that he puts out and the, the amount of effort that you put out, everybody in the cast, who, as I said, I, nothing is, it seems to be left, as from an amateur's point of view, nothing is left backstage. And he said, in absolute seriousness, and I'm sure he didn't know where the reference was from, he said, I, I'm, I'm convinced that I have to do this because somebody may be seeing their first Broadway show and I want them to come back. And I was reminded that Joe DiMaggio was, was once asked, why do you run out every ground ball when your heel is broken? Or, you know, yeah. And he goes, there's somebody out there seeing me play for the first time. Yeah. And there's that attitude towards it, which is, which is really, it's an amazing thing to see, not to denigrate anything else that, that people go and see, but the, mm -hmm. the amount of effort night after night is, uh, I think you underrate how much of the performance is the result of your performance. Well, I well no, I mean I think that that's that's incredibly um, accurate, and and I think that. Thank you. Well, yeah, no, Sorry. I was I was actually commenting on on Andrew. You just commented All right. and Joe DiMaggio. Come up with your own stuff, too. you know. But it's, <laughs> but it's to me there is something incredible about looking out in an audience. And, and knowing for a fact that somebody is having that experience for the first time. And night after night, people tell us that. This was my first show. And we always say to them, we're sorry. Because, you know, I, I do think that it is it is hard, especially in a musical comedy, yeah. to top what they've oh, done. Man, I'm it's, gonna, it's special. I, I went, and I'm not going to say the name of the other show now, but I went to see another show, and you know which one it was, after I'd seen Book of Mormon you, twice. Oh, no, you saw Jutopia, didn't you? No, no. Oh. I saw something else, and it was... <laughs> And there were like there were like three performances were really good, uh -huh. and I couldn't stand the female lead. And a couple of people seemed to mail it in, and there were a couple of name performers in there who did a great job. But yeah. it was like, um, see if I left at the intermission, it's, where, are we, where are we? It's five blocks to the Eugene O'Neill. I could probably stand in the back for the yeah. second. And but but I mean that that that's the sort of problem you want to have. Well, it is the sort of problem that you want to have. And I think look, I think every single musical, every single show on Broadway is, regardless of of the criticisms that one might have for it, a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Given how difficult it is to mount these things, given how difficult it is to do it night after night after night. Everybody pours their heart out into this medium more than I think any artistic endeavor um, because we love it. We're passionate about it. So, you know, but it is, it, it's a significant benefit having writing as good as the writing in Book of Mormon because y you can be a little off and that writing right. will still get you over the edge. You know, I performed one week where I had really, really bad laryngitis. Oh, yeah. where you, I was, you told me about yeah, that. Yeah, where it was, re I had to miss some shows. And it was very disconcerting. I was very vulnerable because I felt like, oh my God, right. you know, I can't use what I need, the tools that I need to do the performance I want to do. And yet the audience still went ballistic for the show because it's a testament to how great all of the components are. And that is a luxury. Yeah. It's a, it's a real big luxury. Yeah. Well, all right. You've been you've been very good about answering all the all the fan fanboy Broadway questions. And now we can talk keep politics. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I wanna, I, I, this is the bridge question from one topic to the other. One night in your audience, you had yours truly. Amazing. Was you that? had Dan Savage, and the third person was Carl Rowe. And he did not come backstage. He to didn't say, come backstage. Well, I was just, so uh, disappointed, Carl. He, why? Is it something I said? <laughs> um, Did no. you, could you see him? I, I, I could smell him. Oh, that's it. It smelled of Voldemort. That's right. There was blood. Um, there was yeah. blood being drawn yes. out of the air back towards his <laughs> yes. corner of the theater. I, I, yes, I, 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 I did. I smelt dead muggles in his breath. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I just. It, it's really interesting because this show has attracted everybody from every end of the political spectrum, and it's amazing because once again you're dealing with something that is profoundly 
profoundly funny and profoundly deep. And I think that people put aside their differences in that regard and say, well, I heard it's a great night at the theater and I want to be a part of whatever this historical moment seems to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it's, it's, it's kind of a historical moment um, for theater. What would you have done if Karl Rove had come back given your political proclivities? What would you have, would you have if, if, he hadn't, if he hadn't come back and said, by the way, I think, I think Obama's an idiot, would you have brought up a political topic? Well, I probably would have pointed my wand at him and said, about a cadaver. <laughs> <laughs> I would absolutely be a gentleman. I think that anybody who's spending as much money as they're being asked to spend on my show yeah. deserves to say whatever they want to say to me, and I'm fine with that. I have my political preferences. He has his political preferences. I do think he's a genius. Granted, I think he's an evil genius. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, you know, I, 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 I really try to put all that aside and, and just be uh, the gentleman of, of the theater. That is, well, while you're on that, that stretch of town, right? Once you, once you step out, once you get past the autograph then, line, no, then it's once, a no Once we're part. at like 50th and 8th, yeah. it's, it's going to be a duel. Is there, and, and I also, always ask this of performers, and, and Mark Ruffalo, who I also met backstage that with night, you, now, yeah. as a, now as a countdown mm -hmm. contributor, uh, I, I, I said, do you worry about, about the reputation of being politically active for what, for, at, what, at whatever side of the equation? In terms of your career, does that ever, do you ever sit there and go, maybe I want to pull back a little bit here, other than in the, the issue of being polite to somebody who's sitting right across from you? Absolutely. One, you don't want to offend anybody who spends money to see your work, to support you. Mm -hmm. You don't want to offend them. Two, you know, I don't want to stand on a pulpit and dictate to anybody what they should and shouldn't believe because that's not my job. I'm an actor. I'm not a political activist. Mm -hmm. But the third thing, and, and kind of the caveat to all of this, is that because of that First Amendment, I am entitled to the same opinions that anybody else is entitled to. And I you know, try to take certain liberties to express frustration and anger when the opportunity arises. Because I do think that we're on a very strange path uh, you know, toward uh, something that is veering away from democracy. And as a father to a newborn, mm. I, I, I take it very seriously, more seriously than ever, because I'm deeply concerned about this nation and I'm deeply concerned about the environment that I'm bringing my daughter up in. And it's, and it's not, you know, God, they're, they're bickering about you know, economics or they're bickering about this. It's about simple things. It's about can we all agree that something called global warming exists? It's about can we all agree that education may be a little more important than that extra $50 billion revenue you're going to give to the oil companies. There are certain things that to me are right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's not about Republican and it's not about Democrat. It's about common sense. And that, to me, is where I get angry and where I express myself more fervently and passionately because there are a lot of things, a lot more things at stake here than an elephant and a donkey. Mm. As a performer, do you think sometimes, as, as I do when I see some of these candidates, particularly the early Republican field of candidates. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, there are people who believe what they're being told by these, by these candidates, who do not recognize <laughs> that there seems to be a very large element of performance in, a, in any campaign, but particularly in the, the Tea Party thing, and a lot of the Republican stuff at the moment seems to be theatrically based. That is, it is based on a suspension of disbelief, yes. and people are buying things they want <clears throat> to believe are true, but they don't realize that they're, they're supposed to leave the theater at the end of the show. Yes, but you know, I, I, I do think that after uh, a decade of success with that theatricality, to me, it goes back to the argument that I made earlier on the show, which is, when are the Democrats going to wake up and start getting their conservatory BFAs? Because to me, there, there is no, if you, if you can't beat them, join them at this point. Mm -hmm. And I really do feel like they have so pulled the wool over everybody's eyes that you're no longer fighting fire with fire. 
you're throwing sticks at a raging fire. And every day, to me, they're winning the debate. Not in, you know, not in my eyes, but in middle America, yeah. they certainly are. And what's ironic to me, you know, and, and there's a whole separate discussion, but the, the greatest irony to me is a lot of these people, not all of them, but a lot of them are trying to strip away the rights of those people who somehow find it imperative to vote for them. And that's always been the illogical kind of quality of, uh, you know, a lot of the people who vote on that end of the spectrum because yeah. I don't think they understand what Tea Party stands for. Right. I don't think they understand that it's not, we want to help you, little guy, or we want to help my middle class parents, you know, out in South Florida. No, it's, we really have a very, very deep economic agenda that is serving a much greater higher base than your salary. Well, you've seen the you've seen the drawing, right? Of the of the of the the mouse holding the picket sign that says "Save Save the Cats" or "Save the Fat Cats." Yeah. There's a Tea Party button, and he's holding that. I yeah. mean, that really does define it. Yeah. And how do you how do you okay? So how do you get how do you get people out of it? How do you wake them up? You show them images of teabagging, and you show what it really <laughs> it means, and then I think they'll clearly understand that this is not what they signed up for. Uh, they 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 trimmed up that phrase too. You're, the first uses of the phrase, the the verb to teabag as a political term, were presented by members of the Tea Party. I was blamed for this. A couple of other people were blamed for this. We we just sort of picked up on this and said, yeah. not only are they the Tea Party, but they're referring to themselves as teabaggers. Teabaggers. Could there be a more appropriate term? I mean, like, but that's the thing is they're so out of touch that they obviously didn't speak to any of their 16-year-old sons who snickered when dad came home and said, I'm going teabagging tonight. <laughs> Your mom and I are going to teabag all over each other. So it's, you know, to me there is something so, so perfect about it. Yeah. About the inanity of, of what this, you know, look, I, again, I think that there are some great, great, great stances that a third party could potentially take in this country. I think that things have gotten way too fractured. I want people to understand who try to defend the Tea Party that that is not a third option. That's right. They are a far, far worse option of one of the two branches that already right. exist. So, you know, if we want to create a legitimate third party in this country, which I think is a great Mm -hmm. great thing to do, then let's do that. But don't for a second look at me and explain to me that there are Democrats in the Tea Party movement, that there are people who are really independent in the Tea Party movement. No, as we clearly saw in the debate mm -hmm. over you know, the debt ceiling, this is a, a much worse evil than we're already dealing with. Now, I know from your experience on Broadway that you're used to having that microphone sticking through your hair and coming out yes. here. Yours is coming a little loose if you yes. want to read it. In fact, it's now popped off. Oh, no. Yeah, so, so I think we, we don't have to go start all over again and do it, but no, I, did, sure. I did want to make sure. There we go. What, what about this? That's it. We'll just, that's I'll go like this that's, for the rest that of looks the show. Good. That's just, Hi, my name is Josh Gatt. That's testing, testing. That's dressed, <laughs> as we say on the stage. Yes. Uh, I was going to. I was going to say. Well, I think. I think we've exhausted all possible topics. But I forgot to ask you uh, if you have any questions for me. I do. Okay. When I sing "Baptize You," yes, has it ever turned you on in any way? I mean, like, it, it, I know, and I look, and I say this as like in a in a different world, in a bizarre world, would there ever be like a, a moment where you'd be like that guy is. I'd let him baptize me. You can be honest. It's only the internet. Nobody's really, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking now, what I'm thinking is, I'm thinking, is it, what, where, does, where does your friend Nikki James fit into this? Oh, well, hey, yeah, we could both baptize her. But the thing is, is, the, yeah, all right, I see where you're going. See, I, no, I'm, it's a fair, it's I'm, a fair I'm, I'm question. Looking, I'm looking for an it's angle here. It's a fair here. question. Like, Totally. All totally. right. No. We'll, we'll no. Never. Wait. 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 We'll wait. Get don't, her don't, don't. I'm not actually propositioning you, by the way. I, I just wanted that. to see if there was, you know, if you looked at me and you said, "Well, I'm coming back for the fifth time because that guy's doing it for me." <laughs> You're, they're going to use this against you when you run. Not in that. Not in, <laughs> when I run. 
What Come on, I'm starting a campaign for you. For what? A uh, local Wisconsin senator will start small and work our way up. You have a perfect opportunity tomorrow if you want one. <sighs> I, I have self-respect. <laughs> I have a, I have a job. I have a tie. <laughs> I have, I have, I have. I can go on Saturday nights to Broadway shows. That's true. I'm going to do that. We don't want to lose the, you in our theater. To, to, from the Senate, from the House, or something like that. Why do I want to take that step down? And doesn't that tell you everything we need to say yes. about politics in oh. this country? We all grew up thinking, well, I mean, what you know, what, what would happen if I someday got to try to run the country? And now it's like, oh my God, I have to spend my time with those people. I know. And that's very really sad, sad, isn't it? I mean, it it's not. I don't sad. know anybody. I don't know anybody who I who I've thought of as intelligent and 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 self self possessed enough to run for office and be intelligent enough to be in it, who's not been in the business for thirty years. Who I would like if I I would think I was thinking of asking you, would you ever think of running for office? And I'm thinking, obviously not. You're 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 intelligent and successful. Why would you want to do that? It looks like we're we're giving the jobs to people who need employment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there was a, there was a Tea Party candidate last year who was unemployed, and that was why he was running for office. Oh At least God. one that I know of somewhere in the, one of the Western states. That's pretty Isn't that sad? amazing. Yeah, growing up, I always had that dream of being in politics, and then I grew up. And I realized it's not, it really, it's, it is sad because, you know, there are great potential leaders out there, kids who I think one day could do amazing things for this country. But the way the system is right now, nothing can be done. And I, this, this partisanship is just getting, it, it, doesn't it kind of remind you in a way, like, aren't we getting, aren't we going back a little bit like aren't we kind of moving back towards you know Lincoln years towards like the 1800s towards Senator the when when the when the congressman from, from Georgia hit Senator uh, Sumner of Massachusetts over the head with a cane or like Hamilton Burr kind of yeah. you know duels in the streets like yeah I, but that Aaron Burr was just a bastard he, he was wasn't, he was not representative he of was his, time. his tweets the guy, were totally insightful sir, the, um, the guy who the guy who hit who, who hit <laughs> Yeah, uh, Sumner over the over the over the head with a cane, and the, as the as it's absolutely true, his supporters in the South, when he broke his cane, their response was to send him new canes. Yeah, yes, I think I'm terrified of that. I've always been, I've been terrified that if the political divide in this country got ever got geographic again, forget it. Yeah, it, it, and it, it happened be, it in be, about 2000. It yeah. happened. Yeah, and that's what's so fascinating to me is that there there has been this regression. Um, and I'm not sure what it was in a response to, but it is, it's a fascinating, it's, it, it really is a, a kind of a fascinating social inquiry to look into that and see when yeah. did, when did we start to go this way again? It was, it's right. very... If you, if you didn't, if you didn't have an, a newborn daughter and weren't worried about what the America was going to look like for her. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the problem. Well, now that we've depressed everybody that mm -hmm. was, who was watching. Do you want me to sing? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, but to what, what, what do you want to say? Well, I'd probably, I'd probably be sued by my own producer. I was just going to say, can't do. We could, we can't even, we couldn't even run bootleg video of the That's show. That's true. Uh, oh, why don't we do a song, I'll, uh, an original song, an ode to Keith Ober? <laughs> <laughs> Keith is doing great things for this nation. As long as you don't support the red states, you'll <laughs> love him. <laughs> Keith is such a great guy. He loves his baseball. And more than that, he loves his Book of Mormon. <laughs> Keith keeps me employed every day of the week. Thank you, Keith. You're putting my daughter to school. <laughs> there you go. Off the that's, cuff. That's it. So the recasting of Book of Mormon. <laughs> uh, uh, Josh Gad in the longest ever edition of Countdown Online. Is it? Uh, yes, well, of course. Exciting. I told you we were running this risk when we started nice. it. Uh, I hope it was of some use to you and uh, and to the remaining viewer on the internet. Now that they've, they've reached the end of the internet here at this at this interview. Thank you, sir, and thanks for My coming. My pleasure. In. Thank you. Pleasure.